Welcome to part two of our lecture on color, the theory and practice. Uh, in part two, we're going to be looking at the elements of color. What are the aspects uh, and elements of color that uh, we as artists are going to be dealing with and learning how to manipulate? Um, for painters, there's, there's four basic elements. There's hue, value, saturation. And because we deal with specific material pigments, we have something called transparency. Some paints are transparent, some paints aren't. And that adds a, a another dimension. But I'm going to stick to just the main three of hue, value, saturation, uh, which are used uh, wherever people are using color in any industry. Uh, I do prefer the word chroma for saturation. It's a it seems to be a more accurate term, but you'll see that that term, there's multiple terms, uh, saturation, intensity, uh, brightness, uh, chroma, lots of different ways to refer to it. So um, saturation and chroma can be used interchangeably. So what do they refer to? So hue is the color of the color, the basic color of something. Is it a yellow? Is it in the orange family? It is, is it in the blue family? So it's not the specific color. Notice our paints. Uh, we don't have red. Uh, you walk into an art store, you'd be really hard pressed to find red. But you will find, um, you know, naphthol crimson, alizarin crimson, cadmium red. All, you'll see types of red. So those are the pigments, and they're the pigment names. Uh, but uh, as a category, or a family of colors, uh, red is a hue, so is orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. Here you can see there's two. Technically this is more purple. Purple has more red in it. Violet has more blue. Uh, most people don't separate these two categories. There's only six, whereas here there's seven. Value, on the other hand, refers to the lightness or darkness of a color. So here's your red again, and we're darkening the red towards black and lightening it towards white. And saturation has to do... Um, again with the intensity of that color compared to gray. So here is red at full saturation or full chroma. And as we move in this direction, we're heading towards gray. The red is losing its saturation and becoming uh, closer to gray. Another way of saying is it's losing its intensity. Uh, it's becoming slightly more dull um, or it's losing chroma. Now what we want to do is be able to manipulate these three uh, qualities of color independently of each other. In other words, very often if you change the hue, you might change the value or the saturation. Uh, what we want to be able to do is how can we change the hue without changing the value or the saturation? Or how can we change the value without changing the saturation or the hue? Things like that. So if we want to look at these as three different channels of color that we can manipulate uh, independently of each other. Uh, so, uh, for example, if we're looking at saturation, many people when they change the saturation of a color, when they, they dull it, uh, they often change the value. So if you add stuff to this red to make it look more gray, it might go darker. And you'll notice in this uh, array or in this color chord, th the value is exactly the same. In other words, this square, this square, this square, they're, they're all the same darkness. And if I switch to this slide, you'll see what I mean. All I've done is taken a picture of this, put it in Photoshop and taken the color out, and you can see it's all the same gray. So when we change saturation, if that's all we're focusing on, then we shouldn't be manipulating uh, value and hue. So bear with me, this is the kind of stuff um, we're gonna be working with in the course. So like I said, hue refers to the generic name of the color, the category, the family of the color. Um, and the pure hues, you know, we're not talking about necessarily value or saturation, are what we find around the color wheel in a typical color wheel. And we'll see pretty soon that the color wheel is a pretty limited way of thinking about color, uh, but it is very, very popular. So we have um, pigments, we have paints, they're very different than the hue. We have two reds, we have two blues, and we have two yellows. Um, these are the, the primary colors for painters, uh, the subtractive primaries. We'll see fairly soon they're not the real primaries, and we'll get into that discussion a little bit later. But just know that what we have in our palette, this is our basic colors that I had you get, is what's known as a split 
primary palette. Each primary is split into two. Um, and they have different qualities, and part of those qualities is one's warmer, one's cooler. We'll talk about that later. So you've got these six colors, which I'd, I'd like you to get out. And then what I'd like you to do is take them on a, on a board, squeeze them out, and then with a tissue, drag them out, and then rub them. Yeah, do, and do them in this order, the alizarin, then the cadmium, the thalo, then the ultramarine. And just come, what happens when you rub them here is that the white of the canvas starts to come through the color a little bit. Uh, over here, they just seem dark and they're kind of hard to tell sometimes. But here, we get a very distinct sense of what kind of color it is. Now, what I want you to do is do this and then have a, have a look at it. And then tell me the difference between the two reds. If you're looking at these two reds, um, what do you see? So maybe you stopped, you want to stop this and go do this yourself, see what yours look like, or you can just continue with me. You'll notice that this one's more orange, right? Uh, if this is more orange, how would you characterize this? And, and don't think in terms of value. That's, we're sticking to hue here. This is a little more purple. Now, it might be a little harder for you to see it. Uh, that's why I say if you do it yourself, it's different because, you know, this is a photograph in a presentation that you're watching on a device. So the colors get changed at every step of the way. So I have no idea exactly what you're looking at. But you will see it in real life that this is a little more purple. Uh, it, ha it tends towards a bluer red, a cooler red, and this tends towards orange. Same thing with the two blues. What difference do you see? And what you should see is that this is more purple and this is more green. This is a greener blue, and this is a more violet kind of blue. And so what that tells us really is that ultramarine is a violet uh, type of blue. Thalo will always be a greener blue. Cadmium red will always have slightly more orange, and alizarin will tend more towards purple and violet. All right, and these are really important qualities. Uh, they're known as the undertones. So one of the biggest things about color mixing and the, and the biggest problems with color mixing and why people struggle with color mixing is that they're mixing colors rather than undertones. What you should be mixing are undertones because this is the color within the color. Uh, and we'll see why that's a problem in, in just a little bit. So what are the undertones down here? Yeah. You probably said, well, and cadmium yellow is more orange, but what about cadmium yellow light? Uh, technically, this is more green. Uh, it might be a strange thing to say, but I think, you know, if you, if you can see it, that's good. You might be able to see it better on your own uh, study. It's more of a lemon. It's kind of acidic, uh, harsh looking, and this is kind of a warmer, goldeny kind of yellow. Uh, so it's really worth understanding the undertones of your colors. So how do you do that? You do this, basically. So when you buy another red, smear it out next to the two reds. If you get another blue, do the same thing next to these blues. Because if I just showed you this blue all by itself, and I said, what's the color there? You just said blue. And I said, well, what kind of blue? And you said, well, a really nice bright blue. You wouldn't be able to see this difference if they weren't right next to each other. So that's why it's important to take all of your colors, if you have other colors, and spread them out and see what the undertones are in those colors and, and learn those undertones, memorize them. So when we just squeeze out a color uh, from the two, we call it a mass tone. But when we break it down and let uh, light or, or even a bit of white come mix into it, it begins to reveal its, uh, its quality and its nature. And that's the undertone. All right, so another way of talking about it is the undertone is the color within the color. All right, so don't think in terms of, you know, reds, yellows, blues. Uh, think in terms of what kind of red. And what I mean by that is what is the particular undertone? So if we look at our pigment names again, really the alizarin crimson tends towards purple, cad red, light, orange, green, purple, orange, green, so on and so forth. Okay, so this is really important, um, and here's why. So secondary colors are colors that are mixed from primaries. Um, so the main secondary colors are green, orange, and violet. So to make green, we mix uh, blue and yellow. To make orange, it's yellow and red, and violet, it's blue and red. 
All right, so we've all learned this in uh, elementary school, probably. Uh, so we look at a color wheel. Here's our primary colors, subtractive primaries, red, yellow, yellow, and blue. The secondaries are in the middle between them. And then between a secondary and a primary, they're called tertiaries. So if you have a yellowish green, it's a tertiary. You have a bluish green, so it's between a blue and a green. Um, that would be a tertiary color. Now, sometimes in art language, tertiary means something different. It means mixing two secondaries. So you get these duller, browner colors. Um, that's not a, you'll see it here and there. It's not very, very common, uh, but most people, this is the, the terminology that they stick to. The tertiary is between the secondary and the primary. Okay, so we're gonna uh, try something. Here's a, a breakdown of that just to remind you we're going to make violet all right so take your we're going to take a red we're going to mix it with blue and we're going to make violet but i want you to use pigments very specific pigments so i want you to mix phthalo blue and cadmium red light okay so on your palette um, this is not handed in so just kind of go for it if it looks a little too blue it means you need to add more red if it looks too red add more blue so right now stop the presentation uh, mix them up and return when you're ready Okay, so how did it go? Um, you're probably pretty disappointed with your mix. Uh, I'm not too sure you got a lot of purples there. Okay, so I'm gonna explain uh, why that happened, but I'm, I'm gonna use blue and yellow and green, another secondary as an example, just so we can, uh, we'll come back to the purple in just one second. Okay, so if you mix blue and yellow, you get green. So it might be logical to think to yourself, well, what's green made out of? Well, green contains blue and yellow. And this is where the science of color really can help an artist. Green does not contain blue and yellow. That's not, so it's not like adding water and flour and making dough and saying what's in the dough? Well, there's water and flour. Uh, color is very different than that. Okay, so here's, here's why. This is our diagrams that we saw in the first lecture, the spectral reflectance curves. This is yellow. It's not a particular yellow. It's a generic yellow. And this here is blue, a generic blue. So notice the difference. Notice how much light is in yellow, which is why yellow looks fairly light, and how little light, so the tiny piece of the rainbow spectrum down here, it's because blue is fairly dark, generally speaking. Notice that the yellow has a lot of green a lot of yellow and a lot of red. So remember, what's coming to our eye is light. So when it bounces off an object, it's light. So it's additive mixture. So it's green and red mixing to make yellow. But also notice yellow has a little bit of blue and a little bit of, uh, in this case, probably magenta or purple, um, and a little bit of blue-green. Now notice the blue has a lot of the blue and the violet and the purple, uh, some green, a bit of yellow, and a bit of red. Now what happens when we mix these two is we literally take these two pictures and we overlap them. And the only thing we see when we mix the two colors is what they have in common. So notice this blue does not have all this red that the yellow has, so that's gonna be canceled out right? Likewise, this yellow does not have all this purple that this has, so that's going to be canceled out. The only thing we will see is what they have in common, and we literally can just take the two pictures, superimpose them, and this is the area that they share. And notice it's got a little bit, oh, barely any color, but it has green in it. So that's why um, the reason blue and yellow make green is because they both have green in them. Uh, green doesn't necessarily have blue and yellow, although technically it does, but here's the yellow, it's being canceled out. Here's the blue, it's being canceled out. These are just trace elements in the same way that the green has red and the green also has a tiny, tiny bit of purple, but this is so low, it's at zero, it's almost imperceptible, all right? So this is the key. 
And this is why these diagrams, these reflectance curves, are really important, because this is what's happening when you mix colors. What they have in common is what you see. All right, so the reason uh, blue and yellow make green is because they have green in them. And the reason green doesn't have blue and yellow is because green is green with just barely uh, traces of blue and yellow in them. All right, another way of looking at it, the yellow pigment might you know, compromise, comprise of this part of the spectrum. The blue pigment is this part. When we mix them, it's only this bit that overlaps that we see. So if there's a big overlap, then we get a lot of this and it goes brighter and lighter. If we have a tiny overlap, then it gets darker and duller. All right, so this should be giving you a clue as to what happened with your purple. So here's cadmium red light. This is what its profile looks like. All right. A lot of red, a lot of orange, a lot of yellow, a little bit of green. Here is thalo blue. It's a very greenish blue, meaning it's very low at the purple end. Okay, what happens when we mix these two? Well, look at these diagrams. Where are they going to overlap? And you can see it's down here. Yeah, It's actually kind of greenish, but this comes out as brown because the whole thing is too low. All right. Um, again, this is below 20, it's probably 10. So this is just a dull, dark color. All right. It has some green. It has a little bit of red. And remember, those two together are yellow uh, to our eyes. If our eye sees green light and our eye sees red light, it becomes yellow. A brown is a dark yellow. That's the technical uh, description of a brown. Uh, so and it's way down here rather than up here, so it's a dark kind of brown. So in other words, there's not a lot of purple in cadmium red. There's not a lot of purple in phthalo blue. So when you put them together, there's not a lot of purple. In fact, barely any at all that we're going to see. So if we took our other two colors, remember alizarin is red that looks purple. It's got purple in it. And notice this little bump here. Cadmium did not have it. Thalo, look at this big bump. I mean, sorry, ultramarine. Look at the, all of this purple that's happening in here. So if we mix these two colors, we literally overlap these two images, and look what we have. We have a lot of purple and blue, and then a lot of red. All right? So we get a brighter purple that's happening in here. All right? So the undertone is really a description of this image yeah but you know we're, we don't go around looking at spectral reflectance curves on the back of tubes of paint uh, this is just a way to understand it what we do is we understand ultramarine blue as being a blue that's closer on the color wheel to purple than phthalo blue and alizarin is closer on the color wheel to purple than cadmium so if you're going to make purple you pick the two colors that are closest to it, which is another way of saying the two colors that have the most purple already in them. Because what you see is what they have in common. Everything else gets canceled out. Okay, So wherever this black is, it's going to cancel everything out like this. Just take this line, draw it down here, and everything above that line goes black. All right, So the two blacks cancel each other, which is why this is called subtractive color mixing. This color is taking out a bunch of light. It's the black area. This color is taking out a bunch of light. You put them together, it's taking out a bunch more light. So you're adding these uh, lack of lights together, for lack of a better word. Okay, now look at this color. If you want a really bright purple, you have to buy it. So this is what we just mixed. And look at the curve. It's still pretty low, which means it's dark or dull. When you buy purple, when you buy any secondary, green or orange, it's higher, so it's brighter. You can never mix this. So if you want the highest chroma, the highest saturation of a color, you have to buy it, all right? Because when you mix, you always go slightly duller um, with it. You don't always go darker because you're not yellow to things and, and go lighter. But when you mix two colors, um, and then this was our first mix, the one that you you did. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to torture you and I hope you didn't struggle too much, but uh, it's a good learning experience. 
All right. So just remember that when we're mixing colors, right, if you're trying to get to something, pick the colors closest to it on the color wheel. This is the Munsell color wheel. We'll talk about this later. Uh, probably, I think it's lecture three. Um, it's, he was a painter. Uh, it's a much more logical color wheel than the one we are uh, usually taught in schools, but I'll explain that a little bit later. Okay, so those are the undertones. Probably the most important thing you can learn about color mixing. Learn your undertones and learn how undertones mix with each other. Okay, value and chroma. Value is the darkness or lightness of a color. Uh, this is a color scale. Uh, so every color has a value. You know, if you're this dark, maybe it matches this. If you're this light, maybe it matches that. And every color can be uh, portrayed in a particular value range. All right. So we, if we take the hue, or in this case, the pigment cadmium red, if you add black to it, it's technically called a shade. If you add white, it's technically called a tint. Uh, if you add gray to it, it's technically called a tone. Uh, I've been painting for a very long time, and I don't know of any painter that ever speaks using these words. They seem to crop up in textbooks all the time, but nobody actually speaks that way. Um, now value, we've seen already in a value lecture the importance of value because it's what gives things their three-dimensionality, their realism. The sense of volume of taking up space is communicated primarily by the value. Meaning we can change the color of something, pink bananas, and it still looks 3D. Just looks like we have pink bananas in a wool. But if we change the value structure, get all the lights and darks in the wrong places, it just looks flat. It doesn't look right. It doesn't look three-dimensional. It doesn't take up space. So that's why value is so important for the kind of painting that we're doing. Because we're trying to make illusionistic, realistic painting. So value is our friend. Um, We've seen this, something similar like this before. This is the same gray stripe um, from here to here, and we can see how the background affects it. So I'm not going to go over that again. What I wanted to go over with you is this. Which of these gray stripes is the same as this one? And you're probably going to say this one. And the reason you said that is because there's no boundary here. So this is a really good tool to use as a painter. If you're trying to figure out uh, values, you're looking at things that have color, you know, that that red apple next to that green leaf. Who's lighter? Who's darker? A really good trick is to squint your eyes. If you squint your eyes at this, you see, you know, this is obviously disappearing, but this will, this is harder to disappear because it's super high contrast and so is this. But if you squint your eye at the edge of two things and it looks like they're kind of merging, then that tells you they're a similar value regardless of the color. If you squint your eyes and that boundary is clear, then you know they're very different values. All right. So it's a really good um, tool because we want to be able to manipulate value with color. So for instance, if you're looking at these two colors, um, who's darker? Who's lighter? Are they the same value? Can you tell? Um, so I'll give you a second to think about it. Um, they're actually the same value, which is this value right here. Uh, if you squint your eye, the boundary between the two starts to blur. Now, it doesn't disappear uh, because one's color and one has no color, so the brain is, is reading that. But I did take a picture of this, and I put it in Photoshop. Uh, again, I pasted it here, and you can see we cannot see the lines. So this is Photoshop took this image and took the color out turned it to grayscale, and the lines disappear, which means these two are the exact same value. Now, controlling value and color is important, especially if you want to use color very expressively and not make it look unrealistic, meaning still have three-dimensionality. So this is a painting, a portrait of a very famous painter named Henri Matisse uh, by another famous artist called Duran. And it was a painting that was revolutionary at the time for the wildness of its colors. You know, you look at this face, all these unusual, bizarre colors, you know, the nose, yellow stripe, purple stripe, pink stripe, green in the eye, yellow in the eye. And yet it still holds together as a three-dimensional, not 100% not convincing because he's not trying to do that. But you can imagine if you were to paint a portrait, we're using every color in the rainbow, 
it would be very easy to make it look like a mess. Uh, it doesn't have any kind of value structure, but if you look at these colors, they actually do have a value structure. All right, so if I was to turn this into black and white, have a look. Here's the shadow in the side of the face, the strong shadow on the nose, the light shadow. Okay, so what Matisse has done is he's chosen colors that have similar values. So these might be all different colors over here. Uh, the forehead might be all different colors. The beard might have different colors, but they're similar values. And so what happens is our brain combines them and we read that uh, as being a tonal area. So that's the trick. If you want to use lots of wild color in your painting, but you still want to make it have form and structure, then you have to make sure the colors are similar in value. Another example right here, look at all the colors in this, this gentleman's face. All the lights here, all the darks here. Again, if we translate this to black and white, it looks like a three-dimensional head because all of these different colors, these greenish browns and rusts and, and maroons and oranges, uh, they're all kind of the same value. <clears throat> Sorry, not exactly, but, but fairly close. So all the colors on the nose, all the colors on his cheek, uh, the shadow that's down here, uh, a little bit lighter there, and that's because this green is a little bit lighter. But that's the trick to using a lot of color and still keeping uh, the form in your painting. Okay, and then finally we're talking about saturation and chroma, uh, other ways of describing it is, is the are these. Um, so really the image on the left, this is high saturation, high chroma, same with the green, and here we move towards gray, and the image, <clears throat> sorry, dulls, and it moves that direction also. Now, sometimes saturation and chroma are referred to as brightness. You know, the color's really bright, or the color's intense. Uh, and that's, that's okay, but it's a little confusing because people then confuse bright and light. If you're going to say something's bright, like it's glowing, it's got lots of color, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's light. So here's bright, here's a bright blue, here's a light blue. High chroma, blue, low chroma, blue. Um, here is an orange. Um, and the question is, you know, orange is lighter than blue, uh, but, you know, can, can blue be lighter than orange? Well, of course, because the gray that matches this orange is, is this gray. The gray that matches this blue is this gray. And we put them together, we can see that, you know, here a lighter color, orange, is darker than blue if it's a lighter blue. All right, so don't mix the two things up. Bright and light are two separate things. Okay, so having reviewed uh, the three basic elements of color, when we return to the color wheel, which is the, the one instrument that's often used to, to organize and talk about color in the arts, we can see that it's extremely limited, that it really only refers to hue. Uh, very little uh, discussion of the value of the hues or the chroma and saturation of the hues. Uh, but within the field of you know, color research and science and the application of color in industry and computer graphics, uh, people have developed much more interesting, um, comprehensive color uh, structures beyond the wheel that really kind of pull all this together. And one of them was, was the painter Albert um, Alfred Munsell. So what do I mean? If we think about a color wheel, it's pretty one-dimensional. If we want to take all the elements we've just been talking about, we would be looking at something more like this. All right. This is a color solid known as HSV, hue, value, saturation. And what it has, obviously, is here's the color wheel. That's the outside rim. Yeah. As each color moves across, it loses its color and goes towards the center with no color and as it moves back out it picks up color again and then as it goes down it goes darker and as it goes up it goes lighter so these kinds of color solids really are much more accurate ways of conceiving of color you know the wheel is is fairly limited 
Uh, something like this is what you know people actually use who are having to specify colors and in industry and science uh, and even in painting but um, unfortunately it's not used an awful lot but we do for most people you will come across something like this if you're working with computers with things like color pickers so if you look up here right you pick your hue on on here and then your your value is how high or low you know that's a uh, very light, that's very dark. And then look where your saturation is, your chroma. This is high saturation, and we go this direction, it's low saturation. So within this space, uh, our particular hue, can we can change its value going in this direction, we can change its chroma going in this direction. And similarly down here, here's the color wheel. The outside of the color wheel is the brightest, most intense, highest chroma. And as we go into the color wheel, we lose that chroma and we go closer and closer to, to no color, which in this case is white. And then we can alter the value down on this scale here. So if you've worked with Photoshop and things like that, you're, you're used to these ways of thinking about color. And they're much more comprehensive uh, and much more accurate. Uh, it's, this was developed early 20th century, really, for painters, again, by this uh, gentleman, Alfred Munsell. Uh, he created his own color solid with pieces of colored paper. Uh, so on the outside, you would get uh, the actual hue. Uh, the highest chroma saturation is the edge. And as you go across the middle, it gets duller and duller because, you know, he's dealing with... Uh, uh, paints and different values. You can see how it gets darker and darker and darker. And as it goes up, it gets light. And as it goes down, uh, it gets dark. So all of these steps were computed by, you know, testing lots and lots of people and saying, when do you see a color change? And so what's called the just noticeable difference is when they would create another chip and either expand it out. You can see sometimes the reds could be bigger than the blues because we can see more variations than some of the blues. And so really his solid would look something like this. And this, is just, this section has been taken out so you can see here's the reds getting duller and duller towards gray, um, a lighter red going towards gray, a lighter red pink until we go up and we eventually hit white. And it goes the opposite direction uh, as it goes down. And you can actually buy these, these sections um, as pieces of paper with little pieces of color and here's one of them and you it's a really interesting color book and you match by taking you get a bag with all these colors in it and they're all just jumbled up and you have to place them you know in the right value because this is the value um, going this way all right so all of these have the same value all of these have the same value if they're darker all of these have the same value they're lighter Okay, these have the same saturation. Yeah, and you see it gets duller and duller towards gray. So this is what the, the purple shape looks like. And it's a really good handy tool to sort of um, practice mixing your colors with, you know, with pieces of chips of color and putting them in the right order. And they also have online versions of this. You can play almost like games. Uh, there's actually one developed by a gentleman on Maui. It's, instead of Sudoku, it's called Hudoku. And you have to put the hues in the right boxes. It's also a lot of fun. All right, so this was developed by Mansal. Uh, this was his color wheel. And you'll see he's got a lot more colors around the edges. And if you see the word P, that means primary. And you'll see there's lots of P's around here, which means in his color wheel, there's lots of primaries which is what we're going to talk about in part three.